kids. Yep, the kids can go on out to the children's church. Yeah. Father, I have a special blessing. Yeah. <laughs> Protection. <laughs> Jesus name. Yes. All right, I am I am fulfilling multiple roles today and uh because our other technology person's not here, Sophia's not here to help us out with the rest of the technology. So yeah, I see the camera did start. All right. So we're good to go. Hey, uh, today we have a, a guest speaker with us today. I've been trying to get Brother Felix to come and preach for a while. And last time uh, we had personal thing, his child was in the hospital, so he couldn't come and preach with us. And this gentleman who is going to share with us today, I got to tell you, I was talking to him before uh, before we came and, and started the service, he's got so many hats on his head. I mean, they stand up like this. I mean, he is the director of the Rescue Us program, which is up at Grace Community. And, and Felix has been doing that for a long time now that, that, that they've been with the RU program, you know, which uh, is addiction, uh, you know, dealing with addiction and stuff. So he's the director of that. He's a worship leader at their church. He is currently a full-time student in uh, Nazarene, uh, NBC. NBC, Nazarene Bible College. He's a full-time student right there. He owns a construction company that they're constantly, uh, you know, doing. I see him posting stuff all the time about the projects that they just got done. And he most recently has become the director of the Danville Rescue Mission. Did I miss anything? I'm a husband and a dad. Uh, yes. Oh, oh, uh, yes. And in between all that, he is a husband and a dad, you know, the three, the three little ones and one on the way. And what? I am one of the commissioners for the city of Daniel. Okay. And, and a commissioner. So Felix wears a lot of hats and, uh, you know, I've been, been wanting brother Felix to come and to share God's word with us for a long time. And so, uh, you know, without further ado, let's go ahead and welcome Felix. And... Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, it's Thank you for that. It's been about a year and a half we've been trying to it, it has been. get this going together. You know, something that really caught my eye was this. So I'm putting together a discipleship program because we're revamping the discipleship program at um, the rescue mission. We'll, we'll be known as VCR. It'll be Vermilion Community Restoration. It'll be the new rebranding. And this is my key verse for the discipleship program. Amen. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. This is confirmation that we're heading in the right yeah, direction. Yes. Um, before we do anything, let's pray. Father, we thank you for life. Thank you for a community of believers, Lord, that we can um, just park recharge, and do it again. Help us, Father, help us, help me to listen. And above all, Father, teach us how to share Jesus. We're in a time where people are searching for truth, God. And so many false truths are just being portrayed in the media, Lord. And it's by design, Lord, it, it's to divide the people, Lord. So, Father, we thank you that on a Sunday morning, we can just get together as a people of God and honor and love you. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Amen. I am... Um, I feel overdressed now. <laughs> we don't we don't ever dress up at our church. I wear jeans, gym shoes, and a t-shirt. And then this morning I was like, I don't know. I don't know. So I, I kept it casual out of respect. Like I should have worn my Nikes. <laughs> um I'm excited to be here um because I think that it is in community. Right, it is in community uh, at RU Recovery. We um, we refer to ourselves as a tribe, 
right? As a tribe of people. And we're a tribe of people because we have a common goal, right? And the common goal that we have is that some of us suffer from addiction. Some of us suffer from brokenness, strongholds, whatever that looks like. We want to come together and fight together. Okay. Um, if you know anything about wolves, you will never see, if you do see a lone wolf, he's usually very hungry. So we love our pack. We love our people. I want to talk to you about something that is really, I think, really important because, um, and I'm going to ask a rhetorical question. Um, how did we get here where we're at today? How did you make it to the church? How did you hear about church? How did you hear about Jesus? I think somebody told us some stuff, right? Yeah. Right? Somebody gave us some good news, right? Yeah. Okay. So I, I want to talk about, um, I want to talk about something that is so important. Um, a while back, uh, I was listening to a message on God's generosity. Okay. How generous God is. I couldn't help but remember the mission that was set before us before Jesus leaves earth. Okay, and, and before he leaves earth and returns home to the Father, Jesus gives us a mission. Okay, and, and I want to look at that mission real uh, quickly. You probably are very familiar with this. If you have a Bible or an app, if you will turn to Matthew chapter 28, and we're going to start from verse um, 16. I think it's vital that um, there's elementary things, if you will, that sometimes need revisited. Because as as time goes on, at least in in my walk, I, I I I tend to forget, right, the reason I do what I do, right, and, and I I'm always reminded, and, and and I have to always stay in God's presence because He keeps me balanced, He keeps me focused. So my ministry isn't the first thing. My business isn't the first thing. I've been called to disciple my family. That is the most important job I have as a man of God. God, me, my family, and then everything else branches out of there. I can't make anything more important than God, right? And I can't make anything more important than my family, right? Because what if in the midst of me saving everyone, I lose my family, right? And, and I think um, growing up old school religion, if you will, you didn't miss church. You were always at church. And I was taught that church is first. You don't miss church. And I want to tell you that God is first. Amen. That right. your Amen. family is first, yeah. right? Those people, people are first. And we're going to talk about uh, what that looks like here. So in um, in Matthew chapter 28, verse 16 and 20, and I'm going to read, and it says this. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded. And surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. When I hear this, it, it it sounds so religious at times, right? Because this is known as the Great Commission, right? There's a song, uh, go, go tell it on the mountain, right? Jesus is telling his disciples, because of my generosity, because of what you have seen me do, 
See, and discipleship goes beyond Sundays. Discipleship goes into Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, when I'm tired and someone has called me at 7 o'clock and they just need to talk. When someone is so lonely that they really don't need anything, but they want you to come to their house and look at their kitchen floor and nothing's wrong with their kitchen floor. They're just so lonely. If we keep the main thing, the main thing, which is people, we will always please God. If God has been so generous to you and I regarding his mercy and his grace, regardless of when you entered into the family of God, because there isn't a position in the family of God, whether you've been in the family of God for 50 years or you just became a member today or last week. God is not a respecter of men or women or persons. Then the question I pose this morning is this, what is my part? And what does that look like? Because as you heard brother Steve describe, I am a busy man. I got stuff to do, I got places to go, I got things that need accomplished. And a lot of times I have to remind myself that the journey that I'm on, I was talking to the uh, president of the board of the rescue mission uh, last week, and, and I was describing to her my, my, my journey, my journey, right? Because exactly almost eight years ago, I lived at the Danville rescue mission. I was homeless, okay? I was homeless. I didn't have an idea of what I was gonna do, but I had a verse that resonated with me that I held on to. And it was Jeremiah 29, 11. When I got to the rescue mission and they gave me my bed and there was a Bible there and it was open and it was open to Jeremiah 29, 11. And it said, I know the plans that I have for you. Plans of hope, plans of a future, plans to prosper you, not to harm you. And I started to talk to Sandy and I said, for the last eight years, I've been just fighting. I've been going. I've been doing what God has placed in my heart. And, and, and here I am full circle. And she said something so powerful. She said, for the last eight years, it may have seemed like you were fighting, like you were pushing, like you were just doing what God had directed, which you were. But you need to understand that God has always been fighting for you. See, the fight isn't ours. Once God has commissioned us, once God has given us direction, a church will show up out of nowhere. Amen. Right? Will. Somebody will come to your house and be like, hey, you want a church? Because it isn't his responsibility because he is walking in what God told him to walk. God said, watch this. And I'm going to put you in the middle of nowhere. So when your church is packed and you have to add on, you can never say it was because we were on the main road. <laughs> yeah, that's how God does things. He, 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 he needs us, right? Does he need us? He desires a relationship with people. Right. And as a result of it, we get to partner with God. If you guys uh, go really quick to John chapter 20, verse uh, 19 and 21. I'm going to read this and I'm just giving you scripture because a lot of times um, I'll, I'll just talk. Right. And I won't give any scriptures or anything. And I always see the look on people's face. And, oh, that pastor didn't even mention the Bible one time. But they don't know that I'm I'm speaking Bible to them, right, the whole time. So I just want you to know that there is scripture, that it can be found, and I'm just giving you where I'm coming from, okay? So John 20, uh, chapter 20, verse 19 to 21, it says this. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked, 
for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them. Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And, and we're going to park here just for a little. How much time do I got? Because I got a Pentecostal background and we might be here to two o'clock this afternoon. Okay. No, just kidding. <laughs> this is really amazing to me, right? Because in the New Testament, you will see Jesus say, I am a lot of times. If you look at the Old Testament, when Moses asked, who should I say sent me? Tell him the great I am sent you. What Jesus is doing here, the Jewish people would have understood. It might have even offended them because they're saying, you're actually saying that you are the great I am. And Jesus is saying, yep, this is me. I am he. He says, I am sending you. See, that I am, this is an I am statement that Jesus made many times. It is also the name of God Moses gave when he said, who should I say has sent me? If we realize that the one who is sending you and I into our communities, our jobs, the grocery store, and even everyday life is the great I am himself, what urgency will we then have in going and telling people? See, I remind myself every day, uh, Friday night, we were leaving RU. Um, it had been a long day. It was about 8.30, almost 9. I had to get gas. Then I had to take my wife's car to our mechanic and drop her car off so they can fix it. And in the midst, I'm getting gas, right? And right in front of me is a young man. And he has um, what looked like hospital uh, scrubs on and he is reading the directions on his brand new car on how to change a tire. He's literally got a paper. He's looking, trying to figure out how to change his tire. I got things to do. I got places to go. I got kids in the car with me. I heard a gentle voice help him. But I got clean pants on, God. Help him. But the kids are screaming in the car. Help him. As a result of me taking time and helping this man, as I was helping him with the tire and we began to speak, he began to ask me questions. And I began to ask him questions. We started talking about God. He said, it's interesting that you would stop and talk to me about God. I've been asking questions about God. See, I don't know if you realize that although this is the most sold book in America, it's been on the bestseller, I don't know for how many years, long time. It's one of the best-selling books in America. 80%, 80%, 85% of Americans identify as Christians. And my question is this. Narrow is the road, and few are they that find it. That's what the Bible says, right? But yet we claim that 85% of us are Christians. See, if we believe what we believe, you and I will be the only gospel some people ever have. You and I will be the only word people will ever encounter because they are not going to pick this book up. And there's something about you and I being the hands and feet of Jesus that resonates with people in such a way. See, when I was a kid, if somebody came up to you and they, and they, and they gave you a word in King James, it would, 
That was gold. Thus says the Lord, when thou it cometh out, this churcheth, thou it will encounter, maybe a traffic jammeth. <laughs> That's not God. That is a King James Version, Old English. When God showed up in my life, it sounded a little bit like this. Boy, are you tired? You've been doing some really stupid stuff. Are you tired? If we look at this great commission that you and I have been given, God has been so good to me that I can't help but talk about God wherever I go. See, if you know a little bit about me, I was a heroin addict for 25 years. For 25 years, I lived in bondage. Although I grew up as a little kid, and I can quote many scriptures to you, and maybe even preach, I got caught up in a drug lifestyle because the knowledge, there's a scripture that says you search the scriptures, because in them you think you have eternal life. See, it wasn't until I made my God a personal savior, right? And a lot of us want the personal savior because we were scared into going into hell, and I don't want to burn, and that sounds horrible, but it says Lord and Savior. At some point, we have to transition from God being our Savior to God being our Lord. And that only happens in relationship. It is in relationship that we begin to understand who he is, who you are, who you are. It is only in relationship that I begin to be able to communicate in your language. My wife and our language isn't the same as other married couples' language. It just isn't. I call my wife bro. Hey, bro, can I have some coffee? And she's like, I got you, dude. <laughs> and it works, right? Somebody else would hear it and be like, you just called your wife bro? Yeah, that's my bro. That's my, that's, that's skin of my, bone of my, that's my, uh. In the streets, we would say, that's my ride or die. Wherever I go, she's going to be there. Right? So in learning God's language, we learn about God. 2 Timothy verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 15 says this. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. A worker who has no need to be ashamed rightly handling the word of truth. Not only is my calling to go and tell the world about Jesus, but also to partner with Holy Spirit in presenting myself holy before the world, rightly handling the word that has been implanted in me. Meaning, if I say that I belong to Grace Community, I cannot leave Grace Community and go right next door to county market and curse out the young lady because she rang me up wrong or worse just be rude see we all have bad days all of us right but we have to be aware always aware if truly you have tasted the goodness of god you have to be aware always because I got to catch myself. See, my biggest vice is I, I love cars, right? I love cars. I got six cars, right? I have a Mustang. Uh, she has a Cadillac Escalade. That's a monster truck. I have a Ram. I have, I, I have cars, right? For some reason, I don't know, but for some reason, when I get in a car and I drop the top down and it's doing this, <laughs> Right? 
I start to feel a certain type of way, right? Because now everything about me has changed. I'm leaning a certain way. The radio has gone up just a little bit. An elderly lady is right by me at the stoplight, right? She has a traverse. Now I'm pulling, Grandma. I have to check myself, right? Because immediately I want to act a certain way. And the reason I bring this up is because we have to be so careful, right? And and I have some questions that, that I want you to really think about this week and meditate on, on, these, on these questions. One is, what is holding you back from telling people, from telling the world? What are you telling the world? And what are you doing life with? Or who are you doing life with? Because you can tell the world a lot without ever opening up your mouth. People are watching. Whether we know it or not, people are watching. People are just watching and they're the, the first thing that will come out of their mouth. And he says he's a Christian. I always have a response. I'm, I'm from the south side of the kingdom. <laughs> we will flip some tables and whoop on some people and then pray for you later. <laughs> a friend of ours has a ministry called Agape. Street Ministries, and on the back of a shirt, it says, pray with me, don't play with me. I know it sounds a little hood, right? It sounds a little, but I think there's a balance where we have to really, really ask ourselves, what am I showing the world, right? And who am I doing life with? If the world um, can feel comfortable around you, and I'm not talking about judgment i'm not talking about damnation i'm talking about if if you still have worldly friends and it's okay to have worldly friends but they feel comfortable around you something is wrong i got friends that will say a few choice words and then they'll look at me and say oh, i'm sorry i'm sorry i said that i'm sorry i did that hey don't don't do that in front of him Our footwork tells the world a lot about us. Matthew 24 says, um, Matthew ver uh, chapter 24, verse 14 says this. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations then the end will come. Some of you are tired and you're like, I can't believe the end is not. Go tell some people some stuff. Are you tired? Do you want Jesus to come back? Anybody want Jesus to come back? Amen. Go tell some people about him. Make it happen. How then, my dear friends, is this gospel of the, king, of the kingdom going to be proclaimed if you and I aren't the hands and feet of Jesus. Go and tell it on the mountains. For I was dead. And now I'm alive. For God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him. Shall live and not perish. This then. Should be our proclamation daily. As we do life. May it never be that we are silent about the generosity of God to us. First Corinthians 
verse uh, chapter 1, verse 26 and 29 says this. For consider your calling, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Some of us were drug addicts involved in gangs, thieves. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. You know what that means? Some of us may have just had a mommy that was recognized. Our dad was never in the picture. You know that statement in the Bible that says, oh, that's Jesus of Nazareth. Isn't his father Joseph? That wasn't a compliment. That was a mockery. But God chose what is foolish in this world to shame the, to, to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring, to bring nothing that isn't into existence so that no man, no human being might ever boast in the presence of God. We serve this God that delights for some reason. You see it in the Old Testament over and over and over. He picks a Samson. He picks, um, if you look at Moses, Moses was a murderer. If you look at all these men that Jesus, that, that God Pick, you would say, I would never pick that man. When picking the next king, he picks David, the smallest of the guys. David's brothers were all handsome, big dudes. Physically, if I'm looking for a champion, I'm looking for the guy that's 6'7", maybe 350 pounds. Can bench a car. Let's pick it up. Uh, uh. That's a champion, right? But God doesn't look at our physical appearance. God looks at our heart. There's so many champions in here. You're not here by coincidence. You think you woke up this morning and decided to come here? No, the Holy Spirit that lives inside you stirred you this morning and said, I need you to get to my house today. So then, my friends and family, I may be considered foolish for believing in this God that was and is to come. And just maybe God chose us, the foolish things of this world, the broken, the lost, the disenfranchised, the misfits, to shame the wise of this world. See, God delights in taking things or people that the world says, oh, I would have never chose him. Oh, I would have never picked her. Oh, that's what they're doing. And God says, yes, this is what we're doing. Because I like to show off a little bit. As creator of the universe, I can do some stuff and things that you don't even know. And a lot of times, as a businessman, right, I'm a numbers guy, right? Because it isn't about the money until it's about the money, right? <laughs> so I'm a numbers guy, right? And I like to, I like to, I like to make sure that everything checks out and, and, and that we have a certain amount of money in our savings and and, 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 and and God says if it depends on you what do you need me for? If you're relying on your bank account and how much money you have where is the faith? If you're relying on the fact that you have a couple of degrees and that uh, uh, you can just eloquently speak what do you need me for? I heard you guys talking about women's retreat and a young lady and you saying, oh, what am I going to learn from her? 
She looks like she just graduated from high school. Looks just like my little niece or granddaughter who doesn't listen to anything. I'm going to the crash. <laughs> I'm reminded of Jeremiah when God calls Jeremiah and Jeremiah says, but I'm too young. Never disqualify a person because of what they look like, because of their age, because of their race, because of whatever you think qualifies somebody. Remember, the greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. I love you guys. My desire is that this week, you be intentional when you go to work, when you go to the grocery store, when you're getting gas, when you're getting your mail, whatever it is, think about it as an assignment. Make it intentional and say, God, where is that person? I guarantee you that person will show up and you will have the exact words at that minute that they need. Your words may be, I love blueberry. And you walk away, I was so stupid. Why did I say I love blueberries? And that person goes home weeping, crying, because their mother loved blueberries. And they were having a hard time thinking about their mom and wondering about their mom. And you just said blueberries. And it sounds stupid, right? Say the stupid things. Now, don't be real, real stupid, but say the stupid things. <laughs> All right, Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for these people. Lord, I, I pray that you expand their territory, Lord, that you continue to draw people here, God. There are no accidents in your kingdom, Lord. They have been strategically placed here, Lord. Now draw those that belong to this fold. Draw those that belong to this vineyard, Lord. Make a way. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Thank you, guys. Amen.